Hello everyone, this is Daim Shabazz of the Chess Drum, and in this segment I'm going to be commemorating the 18th anniversary of the Chess Drum. Uh, it's actually tomorrow, and what I would like to do is to provide an account of the history of the Chess Drum. I don't believe I've ever given it in a video form. Uh, there is an essay on the Chess Drum that you can read about the process. I've headed up since 2002, I believe. Uh, if you go to the chess drum, you'll actually see it posted and composed and written January of 2002. And yeah, it is. Um, it's been it's been a very interesting process. But you look up, and the site's been up 18 years. And I must say that I have been involved in chess for about 40 years. And in the website era, I have seen a lot of sites come and go. I have seen sites launched, and then I have seen them fade into the into cyberspace, so to speak. And it's very challenging to keep a site going, uh, not only just to keep it going, but to keep it fresh and to keep the content flowing so that the site stays relevant. So this uh, idea of the chess drum uh, probably started to uh, sprout um, while I was a, I guess you can say, a rising young player in the Chicago area. I had played scholastic chess. I was uh, on the high school team. And in my senior year, we won the city championship. It was rather unexpected because most of our players were not seasoned tournament players, but we played a lot and we frequented clubs, uh, specifically Tule Park, and we played a lot. We just didn't have ratings. One of the one of the things was that my coach Thomas Feinberg did not allow us to play in open tournaments where there were um, money prizes. Uh, he feared, because of a ruling in the Illinois High School Chess Association or the Illinois High School Association, that if you won a, an amount of money, you would be declared as a professional and you would lose your eligibility. And we, as high school students, we just took it as, as he gave it to us. But then when we saw other players from other high schools playing in open tournaments, we kind of wondered why we were being uh, prohibited from, from getting that valuable experience. And it just so happened that my coach had uh, allowed two of my teammates to play in the U.S. Open in 79, and both of them won prizes. Uh, one of them won the top C player prize, and I believe the other won second place in the in in the D class, and so that was a big deal. And both of these players at the time were stronger than I was, but after the state tournament, as in my junior year, I scored four and a half out of six, which was one of the highest scores on the team. And that summer, I began to study a lot. And we're talking hours and hours and hours of studying openings and playing with friends. And, and then I started going to Tule Park. And my game took on a, uh, a new uh, level of seriousness. And by the time we came back to school that fall, uh, I was beating pretty much everybody and um, including the coach, Coach Feinberg. And I ended up taking over board one. And then that year we won the city championship and we came in ninth in state. So after I graduated, I began to really 
study more and become very serious about my improvement. And but unfortunately, when you when you end up in uh, in in college, you know things change, and you don't have as much time. But uh, what ultimately happened was uh, I continued to play in tournament chess, and I got better. It wasn't I wasn't improving uh, at at the rate that I had before, but I, yet I was still improving, uh, still competing in tournaments. So at one tournament. The it was called the put fun back into chess. Fred uh, Greenberg ran this tournament and it was this new tournament because it had all of these fun things that we did during the tournament with raffles and he had all kinds of free food and he had all kinds of pastries all throughout the tournament and you know, all types of drinks. And it was really a novel tournament because we had never experienced a tournament like that before. And I remember being in the basement because that's where the Skittles area was. And I was talking to a player and we were talking about different things as chess players like to do. And this player, his name is Vince Berry. And we were having this conversation about players, black players, and he asked me about some of the strong players. And he says, well, where are the strong players? He says, well, I know about Marvin and Emery Tate, and, but he couldn't name, uh, nor could I name any prominent players of African ancestry. And he didn't ask me in a very mean-spirited way it was just uh it was just a question he was raising a question and that question stayed on my mind for quite some time i was an impressionable young man and so i said to myself i'm going to find out i'm going to begin looking at this question where are the black masters where are the black international masters where are the black grandmasters where are they do they exist? If they don't exist, why don't they exist? So all these questions come up. And so I began uh, this process of inquiry, and then I began writing letters. And in fact, uh, pulling, pulling out my file, my file cabinet, I have this folder. I have several folders, but this is the one folder where I kept all my letters. Uh, I was writing different people trying to get help on exploring this uh, this question that I had. And so I wrote um, various people. I wrote some players. I sent uh, a number of players letters. Uh, I sent some officials. Uh, I actually sent Fred um, Greenberg a letter uh, about this idea I had. And... I basically was asking him for some advice and assistance. Uh, he did not respond in writing, but he told me that, you know, perhaps uh, I need to um, um, to talk to speak to uh, others and, and, and you know get more interest uh, in the idea. He didn't really have any input for me. He didn't have much uh, in the way of input. And so I went and I wrote uh, Helen Warren. Uh, as I see, she was she was um, president of the Midwest Chess Association. And I wrote her a letter about my ideas about um, black chess players. This was December 22nd, 1988. And she responded. But look, she she sent me um, a letter here, and this letter was dated January 3rd, 1989, and she says, My thanks for your letter on the subject of black masters in the U.S. I am not an authority on the subject, but I do know who is, and I'm going to give you his address. 
and she gives Jerry B. Bold, 377 Westchester Avenue, Port Chester, New York, 10573, and she leaves his number. And then she talks about who Jerry is, uh, what he's done in chess, what he has done in, as an activist, what he has done for black chess players in terms of compiling a list. And she went on and suggested that there would be a workshop at the 1989 U.S. Open, and she would provide a venue, a lecture room, at the Hyatt O'Hare and allow us to discuss this issue. And I had known uh, Helen and her husband, Jim, because I was a, a local player and I was very active. And she uh, wrote, wrote a very nice uh, letter in, in support uh, we did not have that workshop in that tournament. I actually played in that tournament, and um, I think for for whatever reason, I didn't feel that uh, I was ready for for that for organizing that workshop. But it's interesting in that that particular tournament led to some other some other. Uh, uh, meetings. So some of the other people I wrote, I wrote Morris Giles a letter, Stanley Vaughn, who had played in a tournament in South Africa and had written a letter in 1988, the December issue of Chess Life, about his trip to South Africa. And uh, it was a very interesting letter, and I thought I'd reach out to him. I never got a response uh, from him. I wrote... So I see here that I have a letter that I wrote Jerry Bebold, and this was 1996, so this was much further along. Uh, I believe that I had contact with him uh, before because he sent me a, a letter in 1990, and he also sent me a list of black masters. I actually have it here. Well, this is about apartheid. You know, he was really into the uh, apartheid movement. He sends me a list of black masters, Afro-American masters. He used to call, he used to refer to uh, the men of African descent to Afro-Americans. And so he wrote this this um, looks like a from a ledger, the sheet of uh, listing of uh, Afro-American masters, and with their ID, the rating as of '89, first master rating known, and then top rating. So he listed all of these, uh, and then he had notes. He had notes if they won any tournament or if they were. Um, had any other acc accolades, he would add it there. And I have a letter. Uh, okay, this is the letter where I received the materials from Janine Gonzalez, who sent me the materials for um, of, of the inquiry that I asked about uh, chess chess and education. So I'm looking through this folder and I see a lot of different letters to, that I had written in the late 80s. And in 1989, I actually left Chicago to attend graduate school in Atlanta. Uh, I was going to study my for my master's in business and prior to leaving Atlanta, I actually took a trip to Egypt which was a life-changing experience. And it kind of gave me a different orientation towards life in terms of what I wanted to do. And so in 1989, I left Chicago, went to Atlanta, and began my studies in the B-School, as we commonly call business schools. And one of the first marketing classes I had was marketing management and we had to do a marketing plan and I decided that I was going to do a marketing plan on a chess organization 
and I still have the document here. Uh, I, I don't know if I have this on a file somewhere, but I actually wrote a very extensive marketing plan on this Black Chess Network. It's 28 pages. And so in it, I have the, the market situation, product situation, competitive situation, opportunity issue analysis, objectives, financial objectives. So I had a full-blown statement, including uh, profit and loss. So, um, of course, this was for a class, and it was required that we have a thorough, um, you know, thorough, uh, thorough content. And so I had actually called this organization Nubian Chess International because of the influence from my trip to Egypt. And if you go to Egypt, you'll know that the uh, people in southern Egypt, the ones uh, who had some of the, the ancient, the powerful ancient kingdoms were called Nubians. And when I was over in Egypt, they would call me a Nubian. And so because of that, that, um, that memory and that experience, I decided to call this network Nubian Chess International. And it was just a name that I had to have uh, because uh, I'm, I'm kind of putting, putting a, um, these mental notes together in terms of what I wanted to do. So in 1989, the U.S. Open begins in Chicago. Uh, actually, outside of Chicago, I believe that it was in um, out out in the suburbs. I can't remember exactly what hotel that was in, but it was out in the suburbs, and it was a very interesting tournament because I met a number of people, including Maurice Ashley, whom I didn't know at the time, and he was he was paying close attention to Emory Tate's games. And I would see him hovering over Emory Tate, watching his games. And we had passed each other, and he had this shirt on, this shirt that said Jamaica is one of those shirts that you buy when you're there. And I think we had struck up, you know, brief conversations, and I said, you've obviously been to Jamaica. And he says, oh, I was born there. And then we started talking. We just started talking and chatting, and we just, um, we just kind of clicked. And so I believe um, uh, he showed us uh, some games. Um, me and R.O. Mitchell, who actually won the U.S. Junior that next year in 1990. And I have a picture of Maurice showing us uh, a game. Uh, I think he was analyzing games, but then he showed us this very interesting game. Uh, and I was very impressed. And so that's 89. The next summer I was in New York working for Time Warner, Sports Illustrated. And so I met up with Maurice and told him, hey, I'm in town. I'm staying at New York University. And we talked on the phone a couple of times. And then he said, we're going to the World Open. Jerry Beepold and I are going to the World Open and we're driving there. Um, you may want to talk to him. And so I talked to Jerry Beepold and he says, yeah, I'm, I'll pick you up tomorrow uh, and we're going to drive to, to Philly. So on this drive to Philly, I believe it's it's a couple of hours between New York and Philly and we're talking about all of these topics about black chess and about different issues. Jerry has to give his political statement and he has to talk about you know all the um, United Statesians and all the um, people who are the moral bacillus and the other types of uh, terminology that he likes to use. And Jerry was was interesting because he was certainly uh, uh, he was interested in seeing uh, black players have opportunities, and he worked very hard in in. Uh, his efforts and so this this car ride actually took notes I was taking notes in the back seat and Maurice and Jerry were in the front seat and they were talking about some of the the issues particularly as they related to Maurice Mar Maurice was having some difficulties 
and so we would um, so we were discussing that as well and I was in the back seat taking notes on this conversation and Jerry would talk about all of these different issues and I have the notes here and this was July 3rd, 1990. And we were talking about Maurice's challenges. And Jerry B. Bolt talked about the fact that both Maurice and Emery had earned I am norms, but that fact was left out of the USCF press releases. And he was making mention of a lot of different things and uh, it was a very, very interesting uh, ride. It was very interesting. Now, bear in mind, I had that plan. And I had shared that plan and talked about that plan with J uh, Jerry and Maurice during the ride. And when we got to Philadelphia, they were pointing out people. Jerry was pointing out people. He was introducing me to different people, including Wilbur Page, wh whom I met. I showed Wilbur Page my plan that I had written, and his eyes lit up like this is what we need to do. And I met some other players there as well. I first um, first time I, that I saw uh, Alfred Carlin, I saw Pete Rogers, and a number of other players, and I met Stephen uh, at the time Booth, uh, later Muhammad, and was telling everybody about my idea about this Black Chess Network. And everybody was more or less supportive of the idea. Uh, Stephen Muhammad had reservations because he misunderstood what the idea was. Uh, we actually went up in a, a hotel room. I believe it was George uh, Imazenwa's uh, uh, room. And we were talking about this idea and we were talking about politics and all the things that people would talk about if they get... Um, if, if, if they, they gather at a chess tournament. And Stephen Muhammad at that time was, uh, he was smoking these cigars and was killing me. We were in this room speaking about all these issues and he was over in the corner puffing on his cigar and he was just talking about that he felt that, um, you know, it would, it would be very difficult to do something like that now, what he thought I was talking about was establishing a separate federation, but this is what this isn't what um, this idea was about. And so, anyway, it was a very, very tri a good trip. Bear in mind, I didn't know that Maurice would become who he would become, and that I would play the role that I have played uh, in, in in chess as well. We were just two young men, and we wanted to make a difference. And we would write each other. In fact, I shared the plan with Maurice. We met in Washington Square Park and I showed him the plan and actually let him hold a copy. And he read through it and he sent it back and he gave some feedback. And that was it. So that was 1990 after I had finished my internship at Time Warner. I went back and that plan basically sat in my file cabinet. For, for a long time because I didn't have the time or the, the energy to do a magazine. It was supposed to be a magazine, a quarterly magazine, and I was going to build this giant network and have this distribution list. And so during in graduate school, I just didn't have the time. Doing the MBA, MBA was really tough. And then I started a doctoral program so it wasn't until I graduated with my PhD and moved to Florida that I had a chance to even think about anything other than school. So in 1998, it's a very key moment, and I mentioned this in the, uh, in the article, this article here. There you can see 1989 U.S. Open. Nubian Chess International, which is what that plan, the organization 
that uh, I named the 1990 World Open and Gregory Kirsis Black Masters article in Chess Life. So this was July 1998. There was an article about Black Masters and I read it and I was so excited because it was about this idea that I had. Not necessarily about building a network, but he was chronicling history, which was to me, it, it kind of gave some legitimacy to the idea that I had. So I actually contacted later, I would later contact Gregory Kiris and asked if I could use his article. Uh, that was one of the first pieces that I had posted on the chess drum, in fact. But that wasn't really the last thing that spurred me to create the chess drum. It was actually when Maurice became a grandmaster in May of 1999, where well, he actually fulfilled the requirements, I believe, in May, in March. And then he later was conferred the title. And he was actually on the cover of Chess Life. He was on the cover of Chess Life. And I had just come from work. Now, this, we're, we're fast forwarding a bit. This is uh, 1999. And I go into my apartment mailbox and I pull out this magazine and I see Maurice on the cover and it was just so much emotion there because I'm thinking, okay, here's another sign. And I had known Maurice uh, almost nine years or I, I had known him 10 years at that point and we had these conversations. So I'm thinking that's another sign. And so now I'm thinking, okay, I have to do this thing. I have to go ahead and... and um, try to make this this uh, network happen. So 1999 passes, 2000 passes. Now I'm starting to really think about this issue and I'm sketching all kinds of designs. Um, now bear in mind at this time, the internet is blossoming. And so I'm thinking maybe it's not, not feasible for me to do a magazine. So I'm thinking about maybe a website. Maybe I'll do a website. I have a technical background. And so I started thinking about getting the tools to create this site. So I get this tool to create sites. And it um, wasn't really a web creation tool, but I used it and created my first site. First first uh, edition and I had created a banner with a uh, Jimby drum. I'll just show you uh, if I can find it here. So this is the first page of the website as you can see here. This was the first page. Uh, I think I have the file somewhere, but uh, I have not been able to locate them. And, or at least, I can't locate them handily. I think they're in uh, the file folder. But this was the this was the first issue. This is how it looked. And I had a few pages. I had chess crackers. I had a historic moment segment. I had 65th square, which was an op-ed kind of piece. And I also had a, a talking drum segment where I conducted an, an interview. And so that was my first issue. And one may ask, well, how did you come up with drum? What's the whole drum thing about? And I'm thinking about, as I'm doing this, I said to myself, well, it has to have some kind of African you know, symbol, right? It has to have something related to that. And so I'm thinking, and of course the drum 
is an instrument that is used for communication, particularly in African societies, the talking drum. prevalent. And so I thought chess, which is what we are talking about, and then drum would be the vehicle in which I am giving this information. So the chess drum um, became the name. And uh, it has been primarily a one-man shop. Uh, I have not had any assistance, although uh, I may get an article or two here from those who are uh, uh, freelancing or those who want to just make a, a, a contribution. And I have done a number of different things. Uh, I have created some segments on the chess drum that I have discontinued. Uh, I used to have the chess crackers where you would have to solve these, these um, problems. And under historic archives here, you could actually go to that uh, page and you can see all of these different uh, issues that I had. It was basically puzzles and you had to solve these puzzles. And these were games of players of African descent. All of the puzzles were games that they had played and positions that they had reached. And so it was kind of this building my material uh, for the site. And since um, then, I have compiled tens of thousands of pages. And I don't necessarily want to give an exact number, but it's probably in the area of 20 to 30,000 pages uh, at this point. And that's including all the games and all the other things that I have added, the op-ed pieces, the, um, the blog, of course, which was launched in 2007. And the, the other thing is that may not be very apparent is I have an icon on my banner. If you look to your right, if you're, if you're, if you're looking at the banner and to your right, there's this shadowy figure. And that shadowy figure, if you haven't already figured it out, would be uh, Maurice Ashley. So here is the issue that I was talking about. And this was the article that was run in the May 1999 issue of Chess Life. It was a very interesting interview. This is the photograph. And I had a brief exchange with uh, Brian Killigrew about the, the photo. And so this has uh, remained the the icon of uh, the banner, the distinguishable icon. And yeah, it's it's been very, very interesting. I also have other um, materials as well, uh, other icons and other symbols. But this banner has been with the chest drum almost since its incep inception. Um, probably two months I had the the original banner that you saw, and then I had a student of mine who created this banner. It was, I gave him the concept and idea, and I said, this is what I want, and then he created it using some tools. So in 18 years, um, I've seen a lot. I have been to a number of places, and generally what I would try to do is when I travel to another country, I'll seek out the chess community and I have been able to meet a, a lot of people. I have covered six Olympiad tournaments. I have covered a world championship. I've covered several Sinkfield Cups. I have been to a number of, of countries covering a variety of tournaments and hopefully uh, in the 18 years I have provided a service that uh, one can find some value out of. And hopefully in the coming years, 
uh, I will continue to, to have uh, richer content and with a kind of more of an emphasis on doing these types of videos. Uh, and, and so you should stay, stay tuned because I may roll out the drum beat. I had five issues of the drum beat back in 2012. And so this may be um, the year that we put the drum back, the, uh, the, the drum beat back into circulation. So that's, that's basically it. That's the chest drum, that's the history, that's the evolution. And it is a labor of love. That's all I can say, it's a labor of love. You have to really want to do this in order for uh, it to be successful. And um, I've spent a lot of hours, a lot of resources, a lot of time uh, a lot of finances to, to keep it going and hopefully I will get to the point where I can put out a very comprehensive um, book you know on um, the histories you know of chess as it relates to the African diaspora now one last point is that the chess drum is not an african-american website it is a website that covers the African diaspora which includes the Caribbean, Blacks in Latin America, Africa, Blacks in Europe, wherever they may be, this site is providing a platform. In addition, you may notice I also cover major events. So the idea is to bring the African diaspora, the chess playing um, African diaspora to the world present them to the world and also present professional chess to the African diaspora. So that's the whole idea behind this kind of crossing of getting that content and to expose people to chess on different levels. I have had people to compliment me. I've had people to say, I think you're separating people. I think you're separating um, the blacks from everybody else. It's negative, it's racist, and you know, all of these things I have heard a couple of times. And it's interesting because the idea behind this is to show that this segment, which has been overlooked, should be um, given attention because the African diaspora is part of the chess community. And before the chess drum, there wasn't really much in terms of content that you can find. And so it was almost as if African people or people of African descent didn't play chess, which I knew wasn't the case. So that was an impetus for me to go forth and create this uh, site. And hopefully it is clear that players of African descent have made a contribution and I hope to make that into a nice, um, a nice book one day, uh, one day soon, because the material is um, already um, the material is already there. Okay, so it's uh, we're at about a half an hour, and I'm just going to stop here. And hopefully, you have enjoyed this segment, um, the history of the chess drum, how it started, and tomorrow will be 18 years. And I am hoping that the site will continue to prosper. And then maybe in another two years, when we have the 20th, I'll have more uh, to tell you. Uh, obviously, every year I'm going to have a commemoration, but uh, I think 20 years may, may be very special. Okay? So make sure you follow the chess drum, you like the Facebook page, and you continue to support the articles by participating, writing comments, and visiting, and telling your friends, and sharing, and to retweeting. Uh, that's, that's very important. And um, as always, I, I hope to, to keep bringing the latest in chess news 
Uh, and as I always say, keep the beat going. <laughs>